live. Welcome everyone. My name is Brian Tress, Global Destinations and Tourism Leader for EY. We are extremely excited to be co-hosting this webcast with WTTC, the preeminent travel industry association in the world. And the subject is the road to recovery for the travel and tourism industry. Big thanks to all of you for making the time to join us today. We have a robust program for the next hour and a half, so I'll quickly outline the agenda. We'll begin with opening remarks by Gloria Guevara, the President and CEO of World Travel and Tourism Council, which by the way, has done some amazing things for the industry, really been the glue that's held it all together over the last five months. Then we'll move on to a presentation by Maya Whiteley and Robbie Carver, two of EY's regional leaders in destinations and tourism in the MENA and Caribbean regions. They will introduce themselves and present EY's point of view on the road to recovery. And for the final hour, we'll have a panel on what's now, next, and beyond for travel and tourism that I will be co-moderating with Maribel Rodriguez from WTTC. We are extremely lucky today to have such esteemed destination leaders from all over the world, from New York City, Portugal, the Mexican Caribbean, Cyprus, and the Philippines, and from many different types of destinations. So we're expecting a lively conversation that will lead to real action items. We'll let each of the panelists introduce themselves at the beginning of the panel. So with that, I'm gonna hit pause and hand it over to Gloria for her introductory remarks. Take it away, Gloria. Thank you, Brian. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Great um, to be part of this um, session with EY and a pleasure to co-host this. Thank you for um, supporting travel and tourism, of course. Um, from WTTC, greetings from London. Uh, we have a quick presentation. If we move to the next slide, we want to take you to how do we see the recovery. But before that, at a start, uh, just really quick for the ones that they are not that familiar with WTTC, we represent the global uh, travel and tourism sector, a little bit over 200 CEOs from around the world are our members from all the different industries, from airlines, airports, hotels, and companies such as EY and the uh, part, um, panelists that you will hear from today as destinations. They are members of WTTC. And they are part of this important ecosystem. These CEOs define the strategy for a good uh, travel and tourism for our growth. And if we move to the next slide, for 30 years, you will see that we have been quantifying the economic impact of travel and tourism in 185 countries around the world. As you can see here in the chart below, you will see in the gray one, uh, the, the gray line, is the growth of the economy in the last nine years. And the green one is the growth of travel and tourism. So for the last nine years, we have outpaced the growth of the economy. And of course, last year was not the exception. Uh, while the average in the world of the economy was 2.5%, in case of travel and tourism, we grew 3.5% or 40% more. Travel and tourism contributes to 10% of the global GDP, employs 330 million people around the world. That's one out of 10. And what's very important is when you look at all the jobs that were created in all the industries and all these sectors for the last five years, one out of four were in travel and tourism. That's one out of four, which is very important. Here you have the mix of international, domestic, and of course, business and leisure. Moving to the next slide, please. Um, we have done an analysis about the impact of COVID. This is something totally unprecedented, unfortunately, that is impacting uh, our sector heavily. The first number that we published was close to 50 million jobs impacted. The current scenario is 121. And what's challenging is we don't get things right. If we don't move in the right direction, unfortunately, this number can grow to 197 million jobs worldwide. So I celebrate initiatives like this one, where we share experience in the path to recovery because it's very important to try to bring back these 100 million jobs that have been impacted globally. Moving to the next slide. We not only do economic impact reports, I mean, we work, of course, with multiple partners around the world, looks for economics for our economic impact report. But last year, we also looked at multiple crises. And I know that EY will be presented later, some very specific cases, but from WTTC, we look at 90 different situations in the last 20 years. I wanna highlight just three lessons learned that are helping us at WTTC to, defi to define this path forward. The first one is 9-11. We all remember 
which has a significant impact of how we travel and of course the travel and tourism sector. One of the reasons why it took longer to recover from 9-11, at least travel and tourism, was an average of four years, four and a half, some countries more, some countries less, was because we had different protocols around the world. Unfortunately, every country defined their own safety and security protocols without the collaboration from the private sector and without coordination among countries. That's why even before COVID, traveling around the world, the safety protocols are different. In some places, they still ask you to remove shoes. Some places they don't. In some places they ask to remove your phone. Bottom line, at the beginning, right after 9-11, where the first flights that took off, it was very complicated, the experience at the airports, and that didn't help to recover or reveal trust from the traveler. That took us longer. So very important to have the same protocols around the world for that reason. Second lesson, second lesson is 2008. This crisis was bigger than 9-11, however, we recovered faster. Why did we recover faster? Because we work in a coordinated way. That's when the G20 platform was created. Public and private collaboration was excellent. We knew exactly what was gonna happen and the ministers from finance were very closely with the private sector and we were able to recover an average in 18 months. Some countries more, some countries less, but it was 18 months. So this collaboration is crucial for the recovery, the public and private collaboration and among countries. And third is in the outbreaks of SARS, MERS and Ebola, for instance, we were able to travel without a vaccine. Why was that? because we were able to isolate the infected people. Now, COVID is different, yes, and, and in this case, 80% are asymptomatic. So testing, contact tracing, uh, here it plays a very important role to isolate the sick people. So if we move to the next slide, these are the four principles for recovery that we define with our members at WTTC. In the next slide, we will see these four principles that started with the coordinated approach. At the right time, when we reopen borders, we need to do in a coordinated way this reopening. Public and private collaboration, ideally is to open all the countries that they are ready at the same time. We we'll see that some cases that's not happening. And that's why we see also some corridors and bubbles, depending on three components, the medical and the tourism and political component, so that we can create like, for instance, the corridors that we see in Australia, New Zealand, and in some parts of Asia. Very important to remove barriers, again, at the right time. Whenever we open, we don't need quarantines. We need other measures, but not quarantines. And it needs to be in a coordinated effort because if the government's open and the private sector doesn't know, of course, we're not gonna be able to recover. The second point has to do with the travel experience. We see a before and after the vaccine, and, and this is very important. Once the vaccine is widely available and is spread, we're gonna be able to have some sort of normality. And perhaps for the people that already had the vaccine, they will have a stamp in the reservation. But before the vaccine is available, we need to be able to learn to live with this virus and to travel. And that's why testing contact tracing is very important. And I'm sure they're gonna talk about some experiences in some destinations that are helping us to recover faster than others. The third component is the protocols that I just mentioned, lesson learned from 9-11. That's why we at the private sector work with WHO, CDC, and multiple experts around the world to define and come up with these protocols so that the traveler can have exactly the same experience in New York, London, and whatever country that they travel around the world. The hotels, they need to offer standardized experience. And last but not least of these four principles is the continued support from the government, which is crucial. This is not a switch that is going to be on and off. It's going to be some trajectory for the recovery. So it's very important to continue with this support. Next slide, we cover uh, the protocols. If, if we move to the next, you will see that the protocols are very important. And we started with hospitality, defining the, the protocols for the hotels. It's interesting because our members, if we go back one, please, if we, our members define, um, offer their hotels uh, during this situation, during COVID. And in that case, they offer the rooms to doctors and nurses, for instance, in different places around the world, and they were able to maintain those installations COVID-free. So that knowledge, plus the knowledge from WHO, CDC, and all the experts was included in the protocols. And we started with the protocols for hospitality. Right now we have nine different protocols 
We work, for instance, with IATA, ACI, and of course, ICAO for the airlines and airports. And at the end of the, 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 the goal, at the end of the, the day, is to rebuild the trust from the traveler. How do we make sure that we can rebuild that trust and we don't make the same mistakes that we made in some past situations, as I say, so that we can recover faster? These are some of the examples of our members and the logos that they have participated in defining these protocols. In the next slide, please, you will also see that one of the questions was, okay, how travelers can identify who has implemented those protocols? And our members design a stamp called Safe Traveler Stamps. This is an identifier basically that recognizes that the protocols from the global private sector have been implemented. Quite interesting that the, governor, the governments ask us to use this stamp as well. At the beginning, we were not sure. Later, we say yes. And we started, of course, with several governments. Some of those are part of this um, uh, panel where we have, for instance, the government of Quintana Roo, the government of Portugal, and, and several others that are working with the same protocols around the world. Philippines as well has been working with us and others. Saudi Arabia, of course, was one of the first as well, chair of the G20. Very important that they are endorsing the protocols. And we are also working with you and WTO so that we can have the same experience. If you fly, I mean, every single um, leg of your trip or every flight, they should ask you to wear the mask not in one yes and one no, because that will create some uncertainty for the traveler. In the next slide, um, you will see, um, as I have here, the safe travel stamps, more than 50 destinations already have received the stamp, by the way, as recognition for, for their travelers. In the next slide, we have um, the main two goals that, that we have uh, identified. One is how we build trust for the traveler, everything that we have to do has to be along those lines. How do we make sure that people feel comfortable to travel again? How do we make sure that people are comfortable to get in planes, to try to have some sort of normality with the lessons learned from the past? And of course, how do we make sure that we remove barriers? Because when countries open and they impose quarantines, basically they are saying that you're not welcome to travel to that country. So if we move to the next slide, please, you will see those two points that I just mentioned, building traveler confidence and eliminating travel restrictions. And in the last one, uh, one more please, you will see um, that we launch a campaign. We work very closely, for instance, with the School of uh, Public Health in Harvard. And they, according to some research that they did recently, between 82 and 92 percent, the risk of getting COVID can be reduced if we all wear a mask. Because at the beginning, there was confusion about who should wear the mask. And again, while well, we find a vaccine and we make sure that that vaccine is available for everyone throughout the world, it's very important to implement the protocols. It's very important to do testing contact tracing for international travel. But it's very important also to wear the mask. And we announced this campaign, Where to Care, which if you care about uh, your loved ones, if you care about your community, we promote wearing the mask because there is a correlation between the destinations that they're recovering faster and the ones that they're wearing the mask, which is very important. That being said, I want to thank once again for coordinating um, this event. I look forward to hearing for the panelists and, and their interaction to the next slide. And I'll turn it back to Brian. Thank you again. Thank you, Gloria. That was a fantastic presentation. So many relevant themes, um, learning from the past, how to build tra traveler confidence, pre and post vaccine considerations, removing barriers. These really set the context for our upcoming panel and some of the questions we're gonna pose to our panelists. Um, but right now I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues from EY who will give brief introductions of themselves and then present EY's perspective on the path to recovery. And I'll hand it over to Maya. Maya, take it away. Thank you, Brian, um, and good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. <laughs> My name is Maya Whiteley. Um, I'm a partner with EY here based in Dubai, and I am our MENA Future Destinations Leader. Um, and we, you know, out of, out of the MENA office work very actively on, on a lot of some very extraordinary transformational tourism projects that are currently underway, you know, in particular in, in Saudi Arabia and also in the UAE, so, so delighted to be here. I think you know, we'd, we'd like to kick off today with a quick presentation on, on really the significance of the impact 
um, that this is having on the travel and tourism industry globally, as we all know, and, and, and highlight some of the lessons, um, things we can draw down and apply with respect to prior global crises and, and frankly, you know, the resilience that we see in the tourism industry's heightened response to COVID-19, um, and in particular, our, our ability to rebound, um, leveraging, you know, innovative responses to the current crisis and, and with an understanding of accelerating trends that will really underpin uh, the future of the industry. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So I'll begin with an overview of, of, of where we sit today, um, not, not just in terms of the dramatically declining global travel statistics, but, but also with respect to the far reaching social and economic consequences that have resulted, particularly in destinations that are acutely dependent on the tourism industry. Um, so if we jump to the next slide, we'll see that, again, Prior to the COVID-19 crisis, you know, travel and tourism um, as an industry was the second fastest growing sector in the world. Um, and as touched on previously, responsible for one in four jobs um, created globally over the last five years. So, you know, as we've all experienced, I think both personally and professionally over the last seemingly endless months, um, destinations all around the world have been forced to implement stringent travel restrictions. And, and these have and will continue to ebb and flow you know, as the virus is, is contained and a vaccine is generated, but still today, about 65% of the destinations worldwide remain closed to international travelers. Um, and if we look to the forecast for 2020 on a whole, you know, unfortunately, the expectation is that international travel will contract dramatically by anywhere from 58 to 78% for the year. Now, if we touch for a moment on, on what really means, what this really means from a socioeconomic perspective, it, it boils down quite simply to a severe economic shock that in, in many occasions impacts the most vulnerable populations, um, people who rely on the service industry for their livelihoods, um, and in places in particular where the wider economy is, is heavily reliant on the tourism sector. Um, but also, you know, anecdotally here, here in the Middle East, and I'm, I'm based in Dubai, you know, we've seen a complete contraction in, in not only the leisure and corporate travel market, of course, um, that's resulted in significant layoffs and closures and airline bailouts, but also um, creative repurposing of hotels, you know, converting hotel rooms into working suites for remote workers. But, but importantly, you know, one of the most significant sub-segments of the travel market in the Middle East and in, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in particular is religious tourism, um, which equates to roughly three to four million pilgrims a year. Um, so it has had a, you know, globally, as we all know, a massive impact in, in, in the region where I sit as well. Um, but I think, you know, I'd like to ask my colleague Robbie, to our, our Latin America and Caribbean tourism leader, to jump in and, and speak a bit about, you know, industry resilience and, and recovery. So Robbie, over to you. Thank you, Maya, and, and again, uh, hello everyone, good morning and good evening, depending on where you are. As it was introduced, I'm Robbie Carver. I sit in our Miami office where I, um, you know, look at a lot of the trends that are happening in uh, tourism heavy destinations such as the Caribbean and Latin America. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see, um, the next slide here, you'll see a couple, uh, you know, e examples of how the tourism industry has remained uh, pretty resilient throughout the course of, you know, various other crises. Uh, now, it's important to understand the size, scale, and ultimately the magnitude of what we are seeing right now is unprecedented in modern history. So where we end up on that chart is very likely to be um, you know, different than uh, where, uh, where we've seen other examples. However, um, when taking into account these, important, um, these impactful lessons, uh, it's important to both learn from them what went right and what went wrong, and then remember that there is light at the end of the tunnel, as in every instance that we can record, it's uh, obvious that travel and tourism has rebounded. Um, now, as, as uh, you know, earlier explained, Gloria did actually a very nice job walking through some of the pros and cons of each, uh, of each one from 9-11 to SARS. Um, and, uh, and I think the key important part here is that each, each um, instance of uh, a disruption in the travel and tourism industry resulted in different, uh, you know, different um, uh, pain points and then different recovery uh, projections. And I'll walk you through in a second, uh, two examples, one being Hong Kong and one being Mexico that took uh, two different approaches, um, you know, which were both unique and uh, ultimately helped uh, rebound very quickly. Uh, one thing that I do want to bring up from this chart before I go to the examples is that uh, you know, most of the pain, so to speak, is driven by either, um, you know, economic or, or, or political controls. The economic being the percentage of the population that lacks, you know, the means to travel because uh, GDP 
down and income went down. And the other, you know, political is more the shutdown of borders. Uh, for COVID so far, we've mainly been dealing with the, the border shutdowns, which, uh, you know, unfortunately the economic uh, impact, so the loss of jobs and the loss of people being able to have the means to travel is probably still, you know, to be felt. Uh, that said, it's important to know that demand will return. Uh, it might return more slowly, but it will return, as evident just here alone in the U.S. by, um, you know, a hospitality industry that is slowly opening and is in select markets seeing very strong demand, whether it's weekend occupancy coming here to uh, the Florida Keys, for example, or whether it's, uh, you know, markets such as Arizona that have seen an uptick in uh, Thursday to Sunday travel. Um, uh, you are seeing uh, people with the urge um, and the ability to get out where they can. Now, I'd like, you walk, I'd like to walk you through a couple examples here. If you go to the next slide, you know, you'll first see Hong Kong here. I think the biggest takeaway from, from this slide with Hong Kong is first and foremost, its ability to uh, open to uh, a relatively new and proximate source market, which was China. Um, with Hong Kong and, and the government, there was a lot of efforts to reach out, you know, first and foremost to business travelers. Uh, and then through the hotel association, there was a lot of um, uh, campaigns that were focused both on the health outbreak um, uh, and as well as focused on, uh, you know, the offerings that Hong Kong had that made, um, you know, their opening up of the one specific border with China relatively seamless. Uh, the other thing that was important is Hong Kong um, had learned previously through, uh, you know, other, um, uh, you know, health outbreaks that they've had in the past, how to, uh, how to manage SARS. And you'll actually see that, um, you know, given the lessons learned that they had from this specific uh, case study in Hong Kong, they have been able to uh, drive a lot of improvement to the current, um, the current rebound that they're exhibiting. Now on the second slide here that's uh, currently on the screen, um, I'm sorry, I was going, I was going through, the, I flipped them around. Um, on the second slide here with Mexico, I think uh, for one, it's very, it, it's, it's interesting that, uh, you know, we had introducing, um, you know, this, uh, this larger presentation, Gloria Guerrada, who uh, was actually in charge of Mexico, as the Minister of Tourism was in charge of Mexico's, um, you know, rebound, uh, uh, you know, from the H1N1 crisis. Now with H1N1, it's, it's, it's very important background here. Mexico was hit by um, really multiple, uh, uh, multiple punches. Um, they had the H1N1, but they also had, uh, you know, economic issues that were driven by the U.S. financial crisis that started in 2008 and was compounded in 2009. And then uh, they had domestic security concerns that year. So you see GDP uh, fell um, predominantly via, um, you know, the global financial crisis. But uh, of course, the H1N1 completely, um, you know, compounded the problems that Mexico was having. So, uh, you know, what did Mexico do? Instead of panicking, Mexico, um, you know, first went and created a pretty uh, comprehensive uh, master plan strategy and subsequent marketing approach that was geared towards the domestic market at the onset. So similar to what um, uh, you know, other countries had done, and then similar to what Hong Kong had done, well, not domestic, Hong Kong had focused on an adjacent market and really uh, went to uh, promote themselves to that. Um, you know, Mexico looked internally first and tried to define, um, you know, various strategies by creating diversified products like travel routes, magical towns. Um, these were beach destinations and internal destiny and, and beach destinations and colonial destinations in the center, for example. And they mobilized people to travel within Mexico um, through various initiatives. Uh, at the time, domestic travel had contributed to 85% of uh, all travel and tourism in Mexico, which, which is, is not only significant, but, uh, you know, probably, you know, helped save the Mexico travel and tourism industry in that year. Um, you know, subsequently, the hotel occupancy started to rebound. As you can see in the data here, um, you know, predominantly uh, the rebound was observed in 2011, but that's more for uh, international hotels. You actually, uh, if you look at the data tour, the local Mexican um, association that tracks occupancies for the region, you'll see that recovery started to occur in 2010. Um, you know, again, this was driven by the initiatives domestically that Mexico had, while the international, um, while the international um, you know, return was driven by a diversification strategy and nationalities that was supported mainly through the facilitation of uh, accepting other countries' visas and, and removing challenges to get to the market. So you saw Colombia, Peru, uh, Brazil, Mexico did a very good job of opening up the borders or making the borders easier to get to so that Mexico would not just rely on the U.S. Um, demand that was, of course, struggling due to the, the global financial recession. So um, you know, at, at the end of the day, this international strategy, um, product master plan, the strong public-private collaboration, 
the coordinated approach and, and all these other investments uh, really not only benefited Mexico in the short term, but also provided Mexico with a stronger framework for sustainable long-term growth, which it's still seen today. Uh, it was that swift action followed by communication, coordination, and strategic alliances that really put Mexico in a position to not only weather the storm, but also to grow from it, which, which again, is what has helped um, you know, Mexico continue to uh, drive new destinations, new markets, and, and new products. So Maya, I'll go, I'll go back to you. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so I think, you know, with the, the learnings we, we can gather from other case studies, but of course, you know, recognizing that, that COVID-19 is a, is a rather unprecedented global pandemic and, and the scale of the impact it's having um, across the global tourism industry really requires a heightened response. Um, it's also more likely to have, you know, some long-lasting impacts um, on, on key traveler trends, on habits, on preferences, you know, some of which are, are quite likely to potentially even shift to, to be permanent. Um, it's, it's already altered the way consumers are using technology. It's, it's accelerating the uptake of, of digitalization across many sectors, including tourism. And of course, it's heightened the emphasis on, on certain inefficiencies and issues that, that have been facing the industry. Um, and that now more than ever really require you know, creative and, and agile approaches to better manage resources, products, and, and experiences in response, I think particularly to shifting traveler trends. Um, next slide, please. So you know, as we look ahead, I think there are certain key steps we can take um, in line with the learnings from previous recovery efforts and, and in response to these emerging trends. And, and we start with looking at, at approaching recovery through, through phases. Um, so obviously first, you know, bracing and mitigating the impact, providing relief and, and planning for the next stage of, of recovery and being proactive with, with plans to act more quickly, more agile, um, prepare for the worst and, and not underestimate what's happening and obviously, you know, take into consideration and, and learn for future crises. It's also about managing messaging and communications uh, with transparency, um, preserving, you know, employment and sustaining businesses. So, you know, we've seen in, in certain cases, you know, obviously significant layoffs and, and with those significant layoffs that creates a requirement to then rehire, you know, new staff when, when things reemerge. So ideally being able to, to remain, um, you know, competitive once reopening happens to maintain baseline operations is quite important. Um, there's also, you know, a heightened need to really diversify the tourism market. So in terms of lodging offerings, attractions, experiences, targeting different travel segments um, and looking at creative ways um, to, to diversify source markets as certain travel segments recover more slowly, for example, the, the international travelers relative to, you know, domestic and regional. Um, and, and finally, you know, how do you turn the crisis really into an opportunity for destination development? Um, so it is, it is a chance to really enhance these offerings, to create economic stimulus, um, and, and to essentially uh, return online um, during a similar time frame while, while facing more, you know, limited demand with creative solutions. Next slide, please. Yeah, and Maya, I, I think you, you brought up a great point, which I think is very important to remember. You know, while, while we're at a, you know, cycle right now where everyone's trying to, you know, stay afloat and keep their head above water, it's very important to understand that changes that you make today um, to not only help save your tourism, um, you know, e economy can also be, uh, you know, key implementation points for how do you revitalize your tourism industry or how do you grow your tourism industry in the future. Um, you know, EY here has developed a now, next, and beyond approach. Uh, I think in terms of, you know, now, the most important part is likely to listen to the key stakeholders and communicate with each other. This includes owners of hotels and businesses, lenders, government, tourism sales agents, airlines. Uh, they all have their own agendas, but listening to their perspective is very important and communicating is very important. Again, if you look at case studies across the board, uh, examples of um, industries where the tourism industry was effectively communicating with the Ministry of, of, of Health, for example, uh, you know, has helped uh, significantly drive, um, you know, good uh, dialogue and discourse. Uh, then you need to start focusing on the next, you know, how do you revitalize the economy? Again, Mexico did this very well. Other destinations have done this very well by saying, let's look at the product that we have. Let's try to identify areas where we can, um, you know, possibly in a down economy, bring people to certain destinations within an economy that are a little bit more affordable and try to try to get people to see areas that they otherwise would not have seen without, uh, you know, a new marketing approach, for example. Uh, and then the next becomes, how do you diversify? You know, how can you make the road to recover uh, better? Uh, 
not everyone is like Mexico with their domestic population or Hong Kong with the um, with the adjacent market of China. So, uh, you know, start to look introspectively at yourself. What do you have that, you know, a close population might have access to? And how can you, again, as Gloria mentioned, work with the government authorities on a unified approach to safely bring people into your market and enjoy, um, you know, the various, uh, the various aspects of the tourism industry that you have. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, you know, a few other, you know, on beyond, uh, you know, examples. How do you, uh, you know, how do you align yourself with the needs of the consumer preferences? Um, you know, how do you, uh, how do you align yourself with the future, uh, what the future of travel looks like, whether it's from a health standpoint or whether after leaving this crisis, uh, travelers are truly seeking something new or whether they're going to return back to the uh, norm. Um, you know, all of, all of that, I think, will help make this, uh, you know, a better road to uh, recovery. And the most important part is to not only manage your image and manage the communication, but to really think about how you can, uh, how you can differentiate your product and drive new demand, both internally and externally. Um, so back to you, Maya, to wrap it up. Thanks, Robbie. We can jump to the last slide. Yeah, so... We'll, we'll turn it over to our esteemed panelists in just a moment, the main event. Um, but, but I do, you know, we want to leave you with, with a positive outlook, not just on recovery, um, but really on the revival of, of, the, of the global travel industry. Um, and I think, you know, this time has given all of us an opportunity to really look inwards, to really reprioritize and, and recognize how meaningful our travel experiences are in, in shaping who we are as people, but also in connecting and educating the next generation and global societies. Um, and I think you know, what we're really seeing is, is an acceleration of a lot of trends, some of which were already underway but are speeding up. Um, but in terms of things like you know, wellness and ecotourism and, and rewilding and immersive nature experiences and you know, a renewed focus even on domestic and, and regional travel as well. Um, and it's very interesting to see you know, how that's unfolding. And, and it's also, you know, it, it gives me hope certainly and I hope all of you as well. And I think these are all things I'm sure our, our panelists will touch on in, in a lot more detail. Um, so with that, you know, thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to hand the mic back to my partner, Brian, and, and our panel. Thank you, Maya and Robbie. That was, that was great. Um, we've set the context with the two presentations and now have come to the panel portion of the webcast, which will be the remainder of our time. Uh, we'll be dividing the questions into three sections. So now is the first section. It's the current state of the industry. Next is the second section, and that's the near-term pathway to recovery. And then beyond, which I think everyone is really interested in, and that's the future state. What does TNT look like after COVID-19? And, and our panelists, I can guarantee you, our panelists will have all of the answers. But first, a quick round of introductions. I'm gonna start with my co-moderator, Maribel, and, and then we'll go, through, go to each of the panelists, and we'll go in the order uh, you'll be able to see on the slide on your screens. So, Maribel? Hi, hello, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, and good night for some of the... <laughs> for Philippines, for example. Uh, well, I'm Maribel Rodriguez, I'm responsible and leading the membership and commercial team with Gloria in WTTC. And today we have invited our fellow members from different parts of the world. We have Fred Dixon from New York and Company, Luis Araujo from Portugal, Tourism Board, Dario Flota, which is our representative and member from Mexican Caribbean Tourist Board, Maria Antoniette Velasco, which is the CEO for the Tourism Promotion Board of Philippines, and Sam Vasperdios, which is the Deputy Minister of Tourism for Visit Cyprus. As you can see, a big variety in terms of uh, geography and, and, and when it comes to the current situation in a very difficult, uh, different phase, which is going to be really important today to have a, a very good conversation and very comprehensive. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Maribel. Um, why don't we just go uh, take a few minutes for everyone to give some background on themselves. I think it'll be very interesting. Um, why don't we go to the order that's on the slide right now. So Dario, why don't you start? Thank you, Brian. Uh, well, I am uh, Dario Flota, the CEO of the Mexican Caribbean Tourism Board. We are in this part of Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula, who face the Caribbean Sea. That's why we are Mexican Caribbean. And 
uh, since a couple of years, uh, the governor decided to, instead of having several promotion offices, one for Cancun, for Rivera Maya, for the south of the state, we cr created a new uh, state uh, council. And the Mexican Caribbean represent almost 40% of the total of international tourism arriving to our country. That's the relevance of the, this office. Thanks very much, Dario. Uh, Fred? Yeah, hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for pulling this program together and huge thanks also to my friend Gloria and the entire team at WTTC and everyone at EY. It's, it's a pleasure to be with everyone. Uh, I'm Fred Dixon, the president and CEO of NYC and Company, uh, the official tourism organization for the five boroughs of New York City. Um, and we, we are a membership organization. We represent about 2,000 companies across the five boroughs, everyone you would expect, of course, in the travel and tourism um, life cycle. Um, and last year, we welcomed uh, 66 million visitors. So, um, you know, a real impact on our local economy. Um, currently, um, more than $60 billion in economic impact from travel and tourism throughout the five boroughs of New York. Um, so uh, it is an important conversation. I thank you for having me as part of it. So, Brian, back to you. Thank you, Fred. Um, Luis? Hello, Brian, and hi, Maribel. Great being here and great talking to everyone. I'm Luis Araujo. I'm president from Tourism of Portugal, the public entity that takes care not only about the promotion of Portugal, but also about training, investment, financing, anything related with tourism comes uh, to Tourism of Portugal. And I'm speaking from the beautiful island of Madeira, uh, one hour and a half flight from Lisbon, uh, and an island who hasn't had a single death during this COVID and has been for the past 15 days without a single positive case. So happy to speak to all of you from here. Thank you. That's great news. Uh, Maria, and Maria, I want to apologize to you specifically. It's now almost midnight there, so um, thank you for <laughs> hanging in and participating. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Brian. And thank you very much to Gloria and our two other panelists for that very insightful context given to our conversation tonight. Uh, please call me Tonette. I'm actually a five month old <laughs> chief operating officer of the Tourism Promotions Board in the Philippines. So I assumed the COO on February 10, which was the day the Philippines confirmed the first COVID case imported from somewhere else. And so it made my life more fun. <laughs> Obviously, it's more fun here. <laughs> and I'm talking to you from Manila. Thank you for letting us into your homes today, wherever you are. Behind me, you will see Bohol, the, the shore of Bohol that's in central Visayas, which is an hour flight from Manila. And it, it is home to the Chocolate Hills, and the Tarshiers, and our man-made forests. And as you can see, some of the longest shores in the country so come over when you come when you can and i'll be happy to uh, contribute to the conversation later thank you brian thanks tonight i will take you up on that um and sabas or oh sorry there we are yeah uh, brian thank you very much great to be here thanks uh to the wtc and also um, EY for the invitation. Uh, great to meet uh, all of you uh, and uh, Luis, nice to see you again. Um, you know, as Luis said, um, they've had a very low number of cases, as has uh, Cyprus. Uh, I think we've been one of the destinations that uh, has handled uh, this uh, pandemic uh, very, very well. For those of you who don't know Cyprus, it's probably uh, the only destination in the world which is uh, an hour's flight from three continents. So we are an hour from Europe, an hour from uh, Asia, and an hour from uh, Africa. We're a small island, uh, but uh, tourism for us, uh, directly and indirectly, is around 20% of our GDP. So uh, about 18 months ago, we took the decision to convert uh, our tourism board uh, into a, a ministry. Uh, it's called the Deputy Ministry for constitutional reasons. Uh, so uh, I've been active with the ministry for the last uh, 18 months and um, a previous career in uh, hotels, restaurants, hospitality in general. 
Um, one in five jobs in Cyprus uh, is in the tourism industry. Uh, and uh, the impact, as you can imagine, is huge for us. And actually, uh, Maya said before uh, that the drop this year is between 60 and uh, 80%. Yeah, in fact, uh, for Cyprus, uh, we are expecting a drop in 80% uh, arrivals and revenues. So very glad to be here and very glad to uh, hear everybody's uh, shared experience on what uh, we could do going forward. That's great. Thanks, thanks all of you for, for making the time and, and preparing for this panel and participating. It's, it's so important. Um, I think we're going to uh, launch right into the questions. Uh, so, so I'll start with the first couple of questions. And the category is now, so it's really the current state of uh, tourism and travel. And uh, we want to probably keep this to, you know, somewhere around 10 minutes in total to save some time for the two subsequent sections, which are going to be in the future, the near term and the long term. So for the now, um, the first question is going to be a rapid round, so we'll, we'll ask all panelists, and, and we can go in the order um, that's on the screen right now. Um, so Dario, Fred, Luis, Tanet, and Savas. And um, the question is, and it's a multiple choice question, uh, to what degree, if any, were you prepared for this crisis? And A is fully prepared, B is somewhat prepared, and C is not prepared at all. We'll start with Dario. Uh, thank you, Craig. Well, being in the Caribbean, always our main concern is to be affected by a tropical storm. So our crisis management strategy always prevent what to do in the case. Fortunately, the tropical storms, we can be advised days before to take the, the, the the decisions uh, needed and to protect our visitors and to protect the airport and so uh, always uh, a storm affected the side of the offer the buildings the attractions uh, but the demand is always there <clears throat> now is the opposite that we were not prepared for that <clears throat> we were still the hotels ready but the demand is staying at home and it's uh, afraid to take a, a plane Thank you. Uh, Fred? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, I, it's a B for us in New York. You know, we are, are no stranger to crisis. You know, we have encountered, um, you know, a number of things from 9-11 <clears throat> all the way through, of course, H1N1 and SARS and the financial crisis um, in the late um, aughts. But, but this crisis, um, you know, of course, looking back on it, you know, is deeper um, and is more profound than, than anything we've, we've experienced before. So while much of our infrastructure from a crisis perspective was in place, um, we, we had no way, of course, to, to know the depth of this situation. So for us, it, it's a firm B. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Luis? Okay, I will, I will split my answer. Uh, in terms of being prepared uh, for any situation, having companies in Portugal that have more than 100 years and have survived for many crises, uh, having people very well trained for any situation, I would say we were fully prepared. What we were not prepared was for the length uh, of this crisis and the consequences of having a crisis which is not exclusive to our country, it's a world crisis. So as I would say no one is prepared for a world crisis like this one for sure. Okay, so I will count that as somewhat. Um, we'll go to Tanet. Thank you, Brian. Well, my proper answer should begin with the context. Uh, the Philippines is also in the Pacific Ring of Fire. And so we have about, we have 24 active volcanoes. And a month before the first COVID case in the Philippines was confirmed, the Al volcano erupted uh, south of Manila. And the entire country has been preparing for the big one, you know, the, the, the major earthquake that will hit a uh, metro Manila. And we also have typhoons, about nine typhoons, strong typhoons per year. So somehow we were prepared for, for disasters. And so in terms of governance structure, we are quite strong in terms of having a coordinated and collaborative approach within government, across government agencies, and even beyond that, involving private sector. So I would say we were also somewhat prepared because I, as Luis mentioned, I don't think any of any country in the world, no matter how developed or economically advanced you are, 
was really adequately prepared for this time of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. And last but not least, Savas. Uh, I'll give it a B as well, Brian. I guess working in hospitality uh, is always uh, an intense uh, business to be in. Um, it prepares you for a lot of things, but uh, let's all be honest. I don't think anybody was prepared to shut down whole destinations, and uh, that's what happened in Cyprus. I know uh, in other places in the world, uh, maybe flying was um, going on, but we had to shut down our airport for six uh, six okay. weeks, and uh, we're an island. The only way to get here is by air, so for sure, major lockdown. Okay, so the consensus there was clearly somewhat prepared, um, and I think there's some experience for that everybody had, but nothing uh, quite like this experience. And you know, I think personally, I could, we we can all probably say the same thing. Um, and um, let's let's move on to question number two. Thinking back now on the lessons learned from this from this crisis. Um, Provide a few examples of tactics that worked well to mitigate the impact of the crisis and a few that didn't work out as you had planned or had hoped. And maybe we could just go to two or three of the panelists to answer this one. So I'll, I'll open it up to who wants to go first. Well, I, I want to share because our experience uh, has in, in the same initiative, uh, things that works and, and things that don't. Uh, the main thing was to stay in, in, in close communication with the tour operators, airlines, in all those countries where the, uh, our, our, our main uh, number of visitors used to come. Uh, so that has been very useful. We prepared the campaigns for the recovery, for the relaunching uh, for different regions of the world uh, where we were considering uh, that in different times, they were going back to fly and to travel. Uh, that was good to, to know. We prepared a campaign for Europe, one for North America, one for the domestic tourism in Mexico, and one for South America. Uh, and that uh, was good. Uh, we are already running our campaigns in the United States and also in Mexico, where we have uh, flights uh, operating, operating again. But the thing that didn't work is that our consideration that in the same order where the uh, epidemic was affecting the, the, the countries, starting in Europe, then North America, then Mexico, and then South America, and that didn't happen. Because of restrictions of travel from Europe to, uh, for their citizens to travel outside of their, of their borders of the European Union, and the restrictions that are still are in, in place in, in Canada, some of them, because this month they started flying again uh, to Cancun. And well, that was a, a consideration that didn't work. Uh, we are still waiting uh, for the, uh, again, for the flights coming from Europe, from Germany announced to be until uh, September. And uh, some other countries, uh, even they didn't have a, a date. Yeah, okay. if I may add, Brian. Yes. Um, yes. May I? Yes, please, yeah. please. Yeah, for the Philippines, yeah, for the Philippines, I'd like to mention three tactics that really worked well, and and these are three C's, which Gloria and the two other uh, speakers before this panel uh, talked about across the presentations. The first C is really collaboration. A government cannot do this alone, or neither can the private sector or the other stakeholders. Uh, from the very beginning until today or tonight, as I speak to you, uh, there are, I, I have lost count of the Viber groups, messenger groups, WhatsApp, you know, all forms of all platforms for communicating. I think in the age of social distancing, we have we have tightened the the, the communication lines uh, across and within government and, and with our stakeholders and partners. The Tourism Council of the Philippines, the Tourism Congress, I think has, has been active now more than ever. So that's, that's, that really has worked. The strengthening of the collaborative um, mm -hmm. approach to uh, identifying measures to mitigate, mitigate this uh, crisis. The other C is our efforts to build capacity, not only within government, 
but also within the private sector. Because I think across countries, we see displacement in terms of employment. And Gloria mentioned the contribution of the travel and tourism to the economy in terms of employment as well. And in the Philippines, we have a lot of displaced workers also within the formal economy and even outside the formal uh, economy of, of travel mm -hmm. and tourism. So we have spent time uh, during the lockdowns to stage you know, training programs, webinars, just to give people more uh, knowledge and enhance the competencies. For, like the tour guides now are being taught other skills so that they will be altogether you know, economically displaced. And the final C is the value of communications. So the discipline and ethic for having data-driven decisions is, is really important. It's imperative that we have real data, correct data in the age of fake news. We want to make sure that the decisions that we arrive at and the options that we explore are things that are responsive to the real needs, not just of the stakeholders, but also of the country. And now we're looking at you know, the global community. This is mm -hmm. an issue, a crisis that cannot be solved by one country alone. So by, by that measure, I would venture to end this sharing by saying that the collaboration also extends uh, across the borders of our respective countries. Thank you. Great, thank you, Maria. Conscious of time, oh, Savas, one more. We'll do one more uh, to this. You said three, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I have to say, Brian, that the thing that really worked for us is also the thing that uh, hasn't worked. And I'll say what I mean. I'll explain what I mean. Um, we decided very quickly to lock down the destination so that we would be out of this uh, health crisis as quickly as possible. And uh, to lock down a destination, it means you have to uh, um, close your borders. So the fact that we closed the borders, it helped us keep the number of incoming cases of, uh, um, of COVID-19 very, very low. And this helped us from a health perspective uh, keep our health system in check. This allowed us to reopen the economy, and this is what is allowing us at the same time, when the destination is now open, to keep a low number of cases. But let's be honest, when you are controlling your borders and you're very careful about which country to open to and which not, it's not fantastic for arrivals. So uh, it has worked from a health perspective, but um, on the other hand, uh, it's a very big problem from a tourism perspective because it's not something that allows you to build uh, volume or recovery very quickly. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, I think what we want to do now is move on to the next section of questions, which is related to the next in the near term future. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Maribel for that. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much. And I'm going to be very quick with this question. I, I will follow up the order you stated before. So at what stage of the recovery you are right now? That is uh, very important. Can you share that with us, please? Dario. Sure, Maribel. Um, we uh, opened our hotels uh, back on uh, last June the 8th, uh, we established in this state a semaphore traffic and light system to define, depending on two factors, two health factors, the number uh, of the, the, the affected, the positive cases, and the availability of beds in hospitals. And where those uh, two indicators are in, in, a, in a proper level, we are advancing. In, in the next steps of a re reopening. We establish for each uh, sector, hotels, restaurants, transportation, a limit of capacity uh, to, to, for the opening. Now in the orange uh, color, we are able to open, to operate hotels at the 30% of their total uh, capacity. Same thing for restaurants, uh, Public beaches are not open for the public yet because we are avoiding uh, that a lot of people be together in the same place. So this is uh, the, the pace, we, our process. We want to be uh, uh, step by step and, and with order to prevent. Uh, that's so the, the light, light system, let's say. 
uh, exactly like to... and that's what we are we are already in the about 25 percent occupancy uh compared with the 80 percent uh average we had last year that's the comparison i understand so freck thank you Where hi you? mary bell yes yeah, so um uh, in, in new york city we are now in phase three uh, of four total phases um you know we have have moved significantly from being you know what was widely perceived as the epicenter of this situation um, to what right now is a very contained moment. Um, and that is on the backs of a tremendous amount of effort from the healthcare workers and the central workers in, in New York City. So um, our hotels were deemed essential from the beginning. So our hotels actually were never required to close. Um, that's an important takeaway. Uh, some of them have closed temporarily uh, of their own accord um, because demand of course is suppressed but uh, hotels have remained open and restaurants uh, have been able to do takeout and delivery almost from the very beginning. So we are hopeful in the next uh, week to 10 days, potentially to move into phase four, which will bring hopefully museums and attractions, uh, some of them back online as they're deemed um, safe to do so. Um, so most of our tourism product is actually beginning to come back. Now we of course, you know, are very cautious uh, about the, the situation um, as we see waves of this first, first round of virus uh, continue to move across the United States and other parts of the region, but but we remain very hopeful. Um, you know, it, we are humbled and proud of the work that was done to suppress the virus here in New York. Um, and our leadership, our governor and our mayor are very conscious about keeping that low. So we are we have um, implemented a 14-day quarantine for more than 20 states across the U.S. coming into the United coming into New York um, in an effort to contain a new viral spread coming in from outside the market. So a lot of containment. Uh, procedures are in place at the moment um, and we are really focusing on hyper local I know we'll get a chance to talk about that a little bit more but our beaches did reopen our parks have opened and our pools are open so uh, we're beginning to see the vibrancy and dynamism of New York City return uh, and it's been a real welcome sight thanks Fred big effort Luis I know that Portugal mm -hmm. is already open but at the same time some other news so can you explain us in what actual phase you are no. We are open, welcoming tourists and giving them the experience of their life. That's the, the only answer I can give. We're open since the beginning of June uh, and we can only be open because we did a terrific job in controlling the virus. That's the truth. We've been controlling the virus, we've been controlling the access to hospitals. No hospital was more than 60% occupancy. We had our intensive care units who were at 20% occupancy in Portugal. And this was made thanks to clear rules implemented in the right time and people complying. That's the only thing I can say. Now we're open, hotels are working, you can go to the beach. Uh, there are some rules that are uh, 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 forced for everyone, tourists and locals. Uh, if you want to go to the beach, for instance, now, you know exactly what's the capacity in your beach or the beach closest to you through an app. If you go to a restaurant, you have to wear the mask when you enter. You can take it off when you're sitting. Uh, people comply. And I think that's the most important thing. We're not afraid of welcoming tourists and welcoming tourists that have the virus because we know how to behave and we know how to tell people to behave. That's why, and I'm sorry I didn't answer, I didn't answer the previous question, but if you tell me, if you ask me something that went wrong, I would say coordinating approach and coordinated work. This is not let's a matter of building walls. A bit later. Let's, let's it's not a matter of building later. walls. It's a matter of opening bridges. But we're Very open. And, and most important, the, the, the seat capacity and the flight capacity is retaking in Portugal. We have 40% in July and 60% in August. That's the most important thing. Well, Portugal has been over the last uh, months and weeks, and Gloria can, can explain, and she knows very well about that already, an example of how you have been doing and, and coping with the, with the situation. So well done to you and the minister, and thank you for, for your comments. So I would like to move on to Maria Antoniette, please. Can you give Thank us you, Maribel. Yeah, congratulations to Luis. <laughs> you seem to be in a good place right now. For the Philippines, <laughs> while the international borders have remained closed, although some international airports have reopened last month, last June, but uh, one advantage of being an archipelago is that there are 7,600 plus islands. So some islands are COVID-free, some islands have minimal uh, cases, 
some island, one island uh, in central Visayas is quite challenged now in terms of the incidence spiking up uh, as I speak. And so there are disparate uh, situations across the, the country and therefore the situation, whether they are open or not, uh, really differs. It depends on the decision of the local government uh, units, the mayors or the governors. But like in areas in Mindanao, there are places that have brought, have, have allowed domestic tourists. So most of the reopened destinations for now are open to domestic tourists. Although in Palawan, there are like 500 foreigners who opted not to leave the country when the lockdown was imposed. So where, we, where are we right now? We are fortunate that two months back, uh, Gloria spoke to us in a webinar. And so we have taken cue from WTPC in terms of lessons learned on having protocols in place to guide the, our tourism industry. So I say today, we launched the fourth protocol. And of course, we all also benefit from the nine protocols already issued by WTPC. So four out of the nine they have already issued, the Department of Tourism in the Philippines has also formulated protocols and guidelines and standards to guide stakeholders. We have issued protocols for accommodation establishments, for transport, for restaurants, and today the protocols for mice were, were released and published. And uh, last month, in coordination and in very close consultation with private sector and other agencies, we formulated and launched the Philippine Tourism Response and Recovery Program. So it details our immediate medium term and long term approaches, plans and specific activities that are meant to help the Philippine tourism industry recover. As I speak, of course, the major thrust for now is to really boost domestic tourism promotions. So this afternoon, we have a dialogue with all the regional directors of the Department of Tourism, because we intend to do a triage, like looking at political support, are the mayors, governors, local, the cities and, and provinces willing now to reopen. We're looking at capacity, the readiness of destinations, whether they have placed the, the protocols in place, and also in terms of capacity, whether there has been acceptance of the digital app that we have developed in partnership with private sector. So this is a safe pass that allows you to detract and to also provide information on the details of the travelers. We are also checking because our experience is that for since May, we have launched sentiment surveys. We have always asked questions to our travelers. And then across the country, when we visit for like, just to check the readiness of the destination, we were faced with some reactions from community members. So some places are more open than others. Some would still have resistance in view of the fear of having travelers come in who are positive for COVID. And so we are launching a fourth based communications campaign, beginning with a safe campaign, so that we can rebuild traveler confidence and community confidence, and for them to be less scared when they say, ah, it's working, you know, somewhere else. And so, as I speak also, uh, one key factor we're working on with private sector is putting packages out that are really, you know, they, they have value to the target consumers. So now people are conscious of price, of flexibility, of the booking arrangements and, and all these concerns that we have gilded from the surveys. So we are trying to respond to all this in partnership with our private sector, particularly our tour operators in the country. But today the interagency task force also met to make a decision on the soon reopening of, of our gates to international travelers beginning I think by August 1. So thank you, Maria. Thanks, Anthony. Yes, and actually, and before I, I need to go first to, to Savas to ask because we want to know about what is about Cyprus being in the Mediterranean and being an island in what recovery in what phase you are but uh, but at the same time and that, now that you open the conversation that goes to my second question maybe you could as well share with us and after that Luis I would like you to 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 to, to, to explain to us as well about what are you using as protocols, what are the coordination you are implementing with your private sector? As you know, we have been launching our global protocols and we have been working with different destinations to do so. And the reason why we have been doing that is to have a global and common minimum denominator when the travel is going back to, to travel and, and, and to build and help building the, the confidence. So 
uh, it's two questions in one. First, please, uh, Sabas, uh, where you are in what phase? And second, if you could answer us and as well, Luis, and maybe then Fred, uh, what are you doing to, to, to give, to have this coordination? And what about those protocols that are going to bring this confidence to the traveler? Thanks, Maria. Uh, we've issued um, our destination protocols um, at the beginning of uh, May uh, to all uh, stakeholders, whether local or international, uh, protocols covering uh, everything from hotels, restaurants, pubs, cafes, uh, beaches, uh, rental cars, public transport, the airport, uh, everything. You, you name it, uh, there is a protocol uh, in Cyprus. And um, we've made sure to uh, uh, make these known uh, di diplomatically as well. We felt it was very important uh, from our side from the very, very beginning to inform the foreign ministries of uh, all our collaborators about what we would be doing because uh, we noticed early on that it was all about uh, travel advice. So it was it's not enough now to create uh, uh, demand or to make the customer feel safe to travel. It was also important to make every foreign ministry that is going to be giving travel advice to their people, um, making them feel safe. So we really made the point of uh, sharing everything with them, as I said at the beginning of May. Now, the destination has been um, open for business since uh, the 21st of May, but uh, at the same time, that does not mean that every business has chosen to open. Uh, and I get now to your question about recovery. Um, for us, it's still a bit early to talk about recovery because uh, to talk about recovery means that uh, demand is really starting to uh, pick up at uh, somewhere uh, reasonable compared to where it was before. At the moment, uh, yes, domestic tourism, even though very small numbers, is doing well, but international demand hasn't really um, picked up uh, for us. So I wouldn't talk about uh, recovery just yet. I think I would. Uh, um, point out that uh, this year for us is about making sure that our businesses survive into 2021 when I see the recovery uh, really beginning. And uh, the second thing that we are trying to achieve is really show the world that uh, Cyprus knows how to, ha how to handle a crisis and Cyprus knows how to welcome people in a very safe way. I think this is our investment for the future and uh, nobody really is expecting to make crazy money in 2020. Thank you. Luis, can you, can you share with us, because that was very important, uh, coordinating mm -hmm. with the private sector, uh, led by you and coordinating with WTTC and with the global standards. So can you, can you explain about that, please? Yes, we, we started three months ago. Um, every hotel, uh, tour operator, travel agent asked us what can we do to build trust? What can we do to, to, to give trust to our consumers, to our tourists? So we, decided, we decided together with the Minister of Health, establishing protocols for uh, hotels, rent-a-car, uh, golf courses, uh, uh, tour operators, airports, everything. Uh, this was a stamp, clean and safe. It's a voluntary stamp from uh, these uh, organizations or institutions. We have now more than 20,000 stamps um, and we've decided to give also training about this STEM. So we gave training to more than 22,000 people during these past three months. It's based on uh, uh, responsibility once again. That's why we issued a new platform uh, two weeks ago, an electronic platform called PortugalCleanAndSafe.com, where you can see all the establishments that you have in Portugal with the stamp. And you can even make an evaluation with a traffic light system. If you think they're complying, you press green. If you think they're not complying, you press red and we do an audit. We do, uh, together with other authorities, we do an audit to that establishment. So uh, um, it has a very positive effect, not only in building trust from the suppliers. We know our hotels are ready. They know what to do to be ready uh, for these new demands from the tourists and you build trust with the tourist sector. So I think it's, uh, once again, based on responsibility and trust. And we're happy that we're the, we were the first country, or one of the first countries to get the stamp from WDTC. Your protocols uh, to the event sector and to other sectors were very useful 
uh, afterwards for uh, for the enlarging of the stamp in Portugal. So we're very happy with the procedure and we're thinking about it, making it permanent for the future because we do think it's a very positive uh, solution for our country and for building trust once again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, it's very important that we are working together. Uh, of course, that it's going to be lasting for a while because even if we are now pre-vaccine, I'm sure that the, the protocols will last after that and we will be working together in the future. So Fred, where are you in that sense? What, what are you doing? What is your, your job in this particular matter? Thank you, Mary Bell. And uh, I think Luis and Sava said it really well. You know, for us um, in May, we launched um, a new coalition. Um, and it was the Coalition for NYC Hospitality and Tourism Recovery. And we had two primary goals. We knew early on we were going to have to reestablish confidence, um, not just amongst travelers, but also amongst New Yorkers, right? We were a city that was on complete lockdown. Um, and you saw the, the pictures of, of empty streets and Broadway shuttered. Uh, we need to teach New Yorkers how to re-engage with their own city safely um, and to encourage them and build that confidence to do so, so we can show that to the world. Um, so one of the, the primary goals of our coalition was to establish these new health protocols. And my hat's off to Gloria, as always, and the team at WTTC for establishing a terrific template. Um, so we, we established uh, the Stay Well NYC Pledge. Um, it's one of the main components of our roadmap, which we released to the press and to the public last week, which is called All In NYC, the Roadmap for Tourism's Reimagining and Recovery, because we are reimagining a new future uh, for all of us. So health and safety are at the forefront. Um, I think, as, as Savas and Lewis both indicated, these standards are going to be with us for some time. Uh, and we've spent an enormous amount of time over the last few weeks um, sharing these protocols, um, hosting webinars uh, with our members and with, with the public at large uh, about how to adhere to them, collaborating with both government and private sector. So literally thousands of organizations now across the five boroughs of New York are engaged, uh, promoting this uh, dual pledge, right, between the public and the business community. So that's a really important component. Um, you know, here in the United States, we have not seen wide compliance to a standard set of protocols, um, and we've seen the effect of that. But I'm, I'm proud to say here in the Northeast, uh, particularly in New York, we learned lessons uh, the really difficult way. Um, and you see uh, high compliance amongst New Yorkers right now, I'm very proud to say. Um, and we want to make sure that we, we share that uh, confidence with the public, uh, and we invite them in, um, but to do it safely. So. Um, our pledge is, is a really important component of that for health and safety, and you're going to see that continue with us sometime ahead. And, and all of this is outlined in, in all in NYC, the roadmap for reimagining. I want you to share with anyone, and you can find on our website at nycgo.com. Thank you. I wanted to, to as well mention that Dario, Dario, I don't know, we, we won't have time probably right now, but they were the first uh, destination within the Americas to receive a, as well our safe travel stamp. So congratulations for the, for the amazing job you did in that sense. So thanks uh, from the LTTC perspective. Now I'm going to give the, the, the floor to Brian again, because we should be moving to the next uh, uh, part of the panel, which is the beyond phase. So Brian, the floor is for you. Thank you, Maribel. And um, yeah, so now we're moving further into the future. Um, and um, I, this next question is going to be a two-parter, and we will uh, ask all the panelists to respond. And we're hoping that this could be an interactive discussion and sort of like a think tank and with potentially some action items that come out of it. But um, the first part of the question is, how do you see traveler preferences and priorities changing in the long term as a result of this crisis. So any permanent disruption that you see post vaccine um, and any resulting trends and how that will impact traveler preferences and priorities. And just a little direction on this. These are things like um, how people travel or the experiences they want, um, any change in the segmentation of travelers. So leisure, mice and business, safety and health concerns, the need for technology and the new normal. Um, the duration of trip. And, um, and then part B of that question is, with respect to your specific destinations, how will your long-term plans, your long-term strategy, address those expected changes? So we can go in reverse order this time, and we'll start with Savas. Thanks, Brian. I'll try to be uh, quick, because everybody uh, will need their time on this one. Well, uh, Cyprus has been traditionally a very uh, 
sun and sea package holiday destination, very tour operator oriented. And I think this crisis now is going to bring about uh, huge uh, changes. Um, I think the trend that we've all been seeing over the last few years uh, move uh, towards um, individual traffic, uh, slow tourism. I think it's something that uh, is now going to be picking up. And uh, as a destination, we're on that and we're going to be doing more uh, to uh, get on that bus. And uh, specifically, um, it was in our plans anyway, but now we've pushed it forward a lot. Um, building um, experiences that are related to, um, you know, cultivation of land, um, home cooking, uh, authentic experiences that uh, people are really going to be looking for away from um, the beaten path, as you say. Now, in terms of um, the future impact and our, and our long-term strategic plan, I have to say that uh, we are going to be taking a much closer look on destination capacity. Um, there are some areas of the island that uh, have suffered from uh, too um, much congestion in the past, whether this was beaches or points of interest. Certainly, we will be actively uh, trying to monitor that and push people to uh, visit um, the whole destination. Uh, to disperse travelers, that is. Um, diversification, you guys mentioned it before. Uh, that takes a lot of things into consideration, and it's not just uh, about what sort of product you're offering, but uh, how do you do your marketing as well. And uh, what I love about this uh, crisis, if I may say that, um, you know, there has been a reduction in the number of flights to Cyprus. And this means that we have really had to hone our... Um, digital marketing um, um, and we've really had to do uh, really really focused marketing on particular segments particular nationalities and particular cities from where people could fly to Cyprus so I think uh, that sort of additional attention to uh, diversification segmentation uh, source airports and all of that is something that uh, we haven't had to deal with in the past because we have been so um, focused on tour operating. Uh, now is a new age and we need to dance. So that's uh, what Cyprus is going to be doing going forward. Thank you, Savas. I think it's very interesting to think about the redistribution of travelers, um, particularly in, in, in destinations that were, were known previously as you know experiencing over tourism. Now what, what this has done is sort of level set playing field and giving them another chance to sort of start and do it right. And um, I think, you know, technology is gonna be a part of that. Um, so um, great answer, thank you so much. Um, Tanette? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Uh, this is quite aligned with what Minister Savas mentioned in his uh, answer that um, the amazing thing about this pandemic is that it presents us with a huge opportunity to, to do things better, you know. Uh, and, and I say that in terms of one, now, now that we have seen within the Philippines how the destinations have had greener sceneries, how the flowers have become more beautiful in the mountains, how the beaches have become cleaner. So the thrust to, push, to pursue sustainable tourism responsible tourism is something now that has become real, not just for us uh, people in government or in the private sector, but in the communities as well. So now that you, you sense a lot of a heightened sense of volunteerism for people to participate in revisiting the destination so that when they re finally reopen, uh, the carrying capacity will be something that we will all be, be mindful of. And then with that also there is readiness not just for COVID. So right now, as I speak, uh, the, the key destinations in the country are building capacity to have within the islands RT-PCR laboratories. We are beefing up capacities of hospitals, not just for COVID, but to respond to all kinds of health emergencies. We want to make sure all destinations have accessible defibrillators available to all the travelers. So now we're looking at the total wellness and health uh, aspects of that are the concerns of our travelers, not just within the country, but more especially also for our visitors 
from across the world. And then as I was mentioned, uh, well, this COVID is a game changer in terms of how we do marketing and promotions. The Tourism Promotions Board is the chief marketing arm of the Department of Tourism. And so, uh, while well, the beauty of not being so advanced in terms of technology is that it's easier to leapfrog to the available digital technologies that are um, now uh, we are being accustomed to using. So we are also doing this in partnership with a lot of volunteers and, and you know, uh, like-minded partners from the private sector. And then uh, apart from revisiting our Sustainable Tourism Trust and doing our marketing and promotions, uh, now the resource management, uh, and when I say resource, it, it, this has to do with the, the money that we have, the budgets that we have. I think there, now there's greater consciousness in terms of where do we really want to invest uh, in terms of developing uh, the, the country as a, as, a, as a tourist destination. And also resource in terms of people. So now uh, we are revisiting the people's strategy for the tourism sector, looking at how we will be able to help uh, build new capacities, new skills for the tourism workers, both in the formal and in the informal economy. Thank you, Brian, and Savas for that uh, uh, earlier <laughs> points that were jived with, with mine. Thank you. We lost Brian. Yeah, we lost Brian, I guess. Yeah, Brian. Am I the next one? Are you flying to? Are you flying to the Philippines? He's <laughs> Madeira. He's coming to Madeira, Antoinette. He's told me that. Oh, okay. <laughs> on the way to my on the way to Madeira, he changed the course and he's flying to Cyprus. Yeah, yeah, because he he just sent me a message. <laughs> Louis, he's back. Yes, you know. I think when he comes, between the June, Brian is coming. I would like to ask, what are you to build the resilience and, and to and the trust and the confidence of the traveler? Uh, uh, can you explain, for example, Luis, you were mentioning before that you just landed and you were you, you have done a test that was very quick. Can you give us an example that you can share with, with the, the audience and the other colleagues about uh, how was this experience and how this experience could be extended to the, the, to the, to the other mm -hmm. destinations and for the future of the traveling? Well, it's, it's, it's very yeah. simple. You have the most wonderful experience. You have music at the airport these very nice ladies and boys waiting for you, asking you, do you have the test? If you don't have the test, you go to a different line. It takes five minutes to do the test. You go straight yeah. to your hotel, and three hours later, you get the result of the test. Uh, is I that a swab think, test, Luis? Yes, and is and this the, is, is the, the, the swab test? The, yeah. the swab okay. test, exactly. Okay. And this is the so right way to do things. That's why, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and to answer Brian's question uh, or talking about the future and the demand and what will the tourists want, we still have a problem because we're not allowed to want anything because some countries forbid us to enter their own countries and some countries yeah. build walls and don't allow any tourists from those countries to enter their own country. And this is only based on different approaches from countries. And one of the things we regret more is uh, the lack of coordinated approach in these issues. Yeah. This is going to build oh, okay. a lot of damage based on yeah. that hey, and bad scientific Back. assessment. Uh, decisions taken without transparency and taking into consideration one single point or one single fact about a country has just three consequences. Misunderstanding, the lack of trust from the consumers, and the lack of trust in destinations. And this is happening in the entire world. This is not about Portugal. This is about the entire world. And if we don't put an end to this, then surely uh, we can not think about the new demands of tourists, which will surely be seamless experience, will surely be about uh, how safe our country is and how quickly we can answer in terms of health uh, system. Uh, this is the, the real reason why we should be discuss, uh, discussing here. And, and this is something that is lacking discussion in the entire world. I'm sorry to say this. Lu oh, Luis, just a, just a quick question on that. Um, when you, you, you had mentioned that if they had not been tested, they can be tested at the airport. 
that where do they go then if they, how long do the does it take for the results to come in do they need it to takes, be quarantined you can either hours. do the testing you can either do the testing in mainland or at your own place and bring the yeah. tests i brought the test so i entered immediately yeah uh, if not you do the test and you go to your hotel or your home and you wait mm -hmm. for an sms you wait for the message telling if you're negative or positive if you're how long is, negative, how long does it take for that sms <laughs> it takes four to six hours oh okay it's the great. way that you wait for your only luggage. in the united states do we have to wait seven to 15 days so that's no, great no no no, no. even now six even hours <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, for some places, okay. for some places. Yeah. So I'm going to turn. That's a good segue to Fred. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that setup, Brian. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm a little envious of but this rapid testing. We were testing. wondering, Fred, right, where Brian actually went. So yeah. where did you go? Oh, uh, yeah. I got cut, cut off. I did. This is the first time I've ever been cut oh, off okay. on one. So what a great timing to have been cut off. <laughs> welcome okay. to the welcome Sorry, to the digital Fred. world. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, I'll just give you just a couple of quick thoughts. And I, I think um, my colleagues have said a lot of it really well. I think for, for us, you know, um, and Gloria said this at the beginning of the program, we're going to have to learn to live with this virus. It's going to be with us for quite some time. I mean, this could be, you know, years that we're dealing with this situation. But many of you have shown, and, and we have shown to a degree here in New York as well, you can live with this virus successfully. Um, we have a lot to learn. Um, there are serious precautions that we have to take. But in terms of, of parts of the, the business that I think are permanently changed, um, I have great concern for business travel. You know, and as an urban destination and a finance capital of the world, you know, we have relied on business travel significantly in New York over the years, not only to drive demand, but to drive rate, right? So, um, so I, I think the, the days of flying six hours for a two hour meeting and turning around and coming right back, I think those days are over. Yeah. I think Zoom and I think digital technology is, is going to replace much of that uh, business transient uh, traffic that we have enjoyed in the past. So I think we're gonna have to learn to embrace technologies. Um, I'm really happy to say our convention center is in the process right now of building uh, a state-of-the-art digital broadcasting studio. So you'll be able to, to oh. host hybrid meetings in New York, which I think will be the model. People come from the region. Um, I think MICE is something we probably could take a whole nother program to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it, it's really important yeah. for a lot of our destinations. And I think we, the sooner we embrace a hybrid model um, and discouraging folks from traveling really long distances, I think, to attend um, short meetings, um, that may be the best route uh, forward for the, for the overall health. And the other thought I just want to leave you with is really inclusion. You know, the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States um, is significant. I think we are all going through an enormous amount of learning right now um, and embracing it in conversation, conversation and conversating with one another. Um, and I think, you know, we are not going to go back. And you're seeing the young generations uh, particularly expressing how we are not going to go back to the ways of the past. Uh, so that mm -hmm. is an exciting moment, I think, in many ways. Um, but recognizing the hurt um, that has been caused over the years, I think it's going to have a profound impact on travel and tourism as well. And we're dedicated to making sure that in the recovery, we lift up our black and brown communities in particular um, and our indigenous communities um, in the recovery process more than ever. So I think equity and inclusion is going to be uh, a really important topic. And again, another, another whole seminar, I think, for you, Brian. But yeah. I'll leave you with those, those you, thoughts. And, and I really appreciate being part of this. Thank you, Fred. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, it's very important. Um, and, and Dario, what, last but not least, we will end the panel with you. I'll come back after you for a few secs, but um, please. Um, well, I, I think uh, a little bit different of my uh, partners in panel. Uh, because I think in the short term, we will be seeing big changes in the motivation of, of, of tourists. Now, maybe the fear is the, the, the most important feeling about maybe taking a cruise ship or traveling to other continent. Uh, but in the long term, uh, as I can see, I imagine the motivations are, will be uh, the same. Uh, people travel for relax mm -hmm. for vacation to get fun to know a different culture to 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 try the the fantastic food in different uh, countries and it's something similar that after 9 11 when we were talking about that everything was going to change and what really changed it was the safety procedures and people is still traveling they, they continue traveling for the same motivations I unfortunately think that all also, well, as you were mentioning, 
uh, the over tourism uh, places where we're concerned about that, they will be concerned again uh, sooner or later uh, in, in, in the next future. I uh, think that the, as Fred was uh, mentioning, the technology will be uh, a very important factor for the future, especially for meetings. And um, uh, this technology was available, but we really not were very uh, uh, common to use as, as we did uh, in our everyday. Now uh, we have a lot of uh, Zoom meetings or digital meetings. And also that we are seeing that it's going to change is the way we do the marketing for our destinations. Uh, a big part based on technology and also uh, bringing our visitors the, the, the confidence and uh, that they can trust in the procedures and the protocols we're establishing to reduce the risk of uh, to, to, get, to get sick. Thank you, Dario. Uh, that was uh, uh, that, that last question, I think, provoked some really, really amazing answers. So I wish we had more time. We are actually over. So I want to thank all the pre pre presenters and oh, panelists yeah. <laughs> again. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we, we hope that this is both enjoyable and informative. And thank you again for making the time to be with us today. Um, be safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great job. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Adios. Bye.